psychedelic drugs are going mainstream. After 40 years in the legal wilderness, landmark studies in the last decade have shown how they could revolutionize the way we approach mental health. For example, a recent study by Johns Hopkins found that the therapeutic use of magic mushrooms can be four times more effective than antidepressants. And as evidence has mounted, so has investment. In 2020 alone, half a dozen psychedelic pharma companies have floated on the stock market. And in October, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, was legalized in two US states. Turn on, tune in, drop out. It's a far cry from the tie-dye image of the psychedelic 1960s. I've been involved in the movement to legalize psychedelics for the last 15 years. I'm also a director of Breaking Convention, which is Europe's largest conference on psychedelic medicine and culture. So I've seen these substances go from niche counterculture to mainstream acceptance in a relatively short space of time. And while it's certainly exciting, almost everyone I've spoken to lately has expressed some concern about the way psychedelics are entering the mainstream. With more and more companies looking to capitalize on the psychedelic renaissance, we're seeing a gold rush of investment. Understandably, a lot of people are concerned where it could lead. The first is it's not gonna look anything like um, what the early revolutionaries, ambassadors and advocates hoped or wished. And that's just kind of table stakes, things never do. We, we thought we were getting Woodstock and we're gonna get Prozac Nation 2.0. We will have a bastardization of psychedelic medicines that exist in the commercial landscape. Absolutely. And I think we will also always have incredibly profound, transformative and well-held ways of accessing this. The more research we, we do with this now, the more we're realizing how, how complicated it is. This way of working requires such a solid interpersonal container and such a strong network of support from people that understand about this kind of work, and we don't really have that in place yet. However, I've also spoken to others who see increased investment as a really important step. To us, philosophically, we think business, when done properly, when done ethically, is a is a great amplifier. You know, it, it encourages innovation, it encourages excitement, it encourages new participants to come in, and that's what we think the importance and advantage of having a for-profit aspect of the industry um, does. If the medicine in question was a new SSRI antidepressant, we probably wouldn't be having this kind of debate. But psychedelics are a fundamentally different type of drug, because it's not just the drug itself that has the effect. Otherwise, everyone who took LSD at a festival would suddenly be cured of all their trauma. It's actually the therapy combined with psychedelics that's proving so beneficial to people suffering from depression, anxiety, and other conditions. When it's done well, this form of therapy can elicit powerful mystical experiences that fundamentally change our outlook on life. This isn't a job to rush if you think that somebody could have one of the most profound experiences of their whole lives in here. So the obvious concern is how will this complex, intricate form of healing survive being funded and then upscaled into the mainstream? I'm going to give you this cup that contains lysergic acid, 100 microgram. Will you drink it? Within a few years of LSD being made available by Sandoz Laboratories, the drug made its way into the hands of psychologists who quickly realized it could have powerful therapeutic effects. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? <sighs> but the experiences weren't just psychological, they were profoundly spiritual. And when LSD left the labs and hit the streets, it had a powerful effect on the counterculture. People started looking to new thinkers, to gurus, and to indigenous shamans for new ways of living and being. The majority of young people are very interested in Eastern philosophy, perhaps because they're unsatisfied with uh, their own philosophy or religion. Indigenous healers like Maria Sabina, who introduced the West to the sacramental use of psilocybin mushrooms, became so popular that people would travel from the US to Mexico to visit her, usually uninvited. But by 1971, this cultural explosion led to psychedelic substances being banned in most countries. 
This also meant that clinical medicine no longer had access to them to research. But the psychedelic cat was out of the bag. The counterculture had laid down a framework of using traditional psychedelic plants for spiritual healing and growth. Now, more than 50 years after the counterculture discovered the healing properties of psychedelic drugs, researchers are integrating them into a Western medical framework. And many scientists in the field agree that it's the profound spiritual or mystical experience people can have during the psychedelic therapy that's the most healing aspect of it. These experiences are characterized by a sense of unity, a feeling that all people and things are connected, and a deeply felt sense of encountering ultimate reality. These experiences are felt to be more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. But to create the conditions for a transformative experience is no simple task. In clinical trials to date, Usually a pair of qualified psychologists or psychotherapists guide each patient in an experience specifically tailored to them. The setting in which people have the experience is also key. It needs to be relaxing and it needs to feel safe. In many ways, this form of healing is a modern return to something ancient. Psychedelics have been used by humans for insight, spiritual practice, and healing for tens of thousands of years. And the use of psychedelic plants to change our consciousness is one of the oldest forms of spiritual practice. I spoke to ayahuasca shaman Jose Lopez Sanchez to understand more about the Shipibo model of psychedelic healing. Entonces, eh, 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 yo creo que la medicina eh, indígena o, o a través de las dietas con plantas o amazónica eh, es un estudio, eh, como se dice, eh, donde que tú buscas eh, la raíz de cada de cada problema eh, eh, sea de diferentes eh, nombres eh, de, de enfermedades o sea nombres científicas no pero muchas veces eh, 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 estudiándolo bien eh, puede aparecer diferentes síntomas pero el punto eh, eh, es, es es muchas veces eh, eh, traumas más que todo no y que a través de ello produce diferentes tipos de, de enfermedades. Entonces, la medicina eh, shipibo, o, o, o hablemos de, de la planta, o el conocimiento shipibo o indígena, eh, te ayuda a encontrar esa, esos puntos, o sea, esa, eh, de dónde provienen realmente las enfermedades, ¿no? O sea, a veces no decimos que, ah, eh, tenemos esto, pero jamás nos acordamos, ¿no? N nuestra niñez, juventud y tantas cosas más. Y la diferencia eh, 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 es que la medicina eh, tradicional o, o amazónica, tr tratamos de, 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 de curar eh, desde el raíz para que eso, esa enfermedad no vuelva a aparecer. O sea, tratamos de eliminar todas esas energías, esas traumas eh, y tantas cosas más que, 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 que cargamos en la lucha. Que, 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 que... Unlike the Shipibo, in the West, we don't have a complex and intricate framework for these experiences. Instead, we're trying to develop them as we go. I spoke to Dr. Rosalind Watts, who is the clinical lead on a recent trial at Imperial College looking at psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, to find out what that really involves. So the Imperial study, it was the second psilocybin for depression study, comparing psilocybin, high dose psilocybin treatment, to an SSRI antidepressant medication. What were the, the kind of findings just on, on the ground? I know the results haven't come out yet, but what, what, what kind of emerged from that process? What emerged was the difference between these two ways of treating depression. Oh God, no. The way it worked with the depression, with the psilocybin group, people had these experiences of really going towards what was difficult in their life, sitting with the things that were hard facing them and learning from them. And the, the, the treatment process was more of a kind of journey, really opening things up, going towards the things that are, are painful. And then with the six weeks of antidepressant medication, People tend to describe that they feel a bit better, they feel like they can cope a bit better, but that they don't really like the feeling. They feel a bit numb, they feel a bit cut off, and they're still very aware that there's this sea of 
stuff that needs to be explored. So they're just kind of sitting on it. It's the, uh, the idea of a plaster over a huge wound. So many of the people in the antidepressant group felt afterwards when they found out that they'd been on the antidepressants that they did feel a bit better, but they wanted to go off them and they wanted to seek psilocybin treatment in, instead. And so there's a lot of excitement around psychedelic medicine and, and psilocybin in particular. Um, and I know a lot of people see it as kind of a, a panacea, something that's just going to cure everything. Is, is that the case or what, what's the real situation? Well, um, the more research we, we do with this now, the more we're realizing how, how complicated it is. And that alongside this amazing opening, which I still am so grateful for that, because for the participants in our study that had the, the high dose psilocybin, how, much, how powerful this, this experience is and how much change it can bring about and how much transformation and learning, there is still this in, increased sensitivity and openness. With that increased sensitivity and openness comes sensitivity to life. And afterwards, the, the current protocols we have are very short term. So people have this huge opening. They see themselves differently. They feel more connected. They feel more thin skinned in a way. Life affects them more. And then they go back into their old life and they don't have support and they don't, they're, we don't yet have the structures for supporting people going through this kind of work. And it can be really hard for them, really destabilizing. So we're learning more and more that these, this way of working requires such a solid interpersonal container and such a strong network of support from people that understand about this kind of work. And we don't really have that in place yet. The kind of ongoing care required for effective psychedelic therapy is potentially very expensive and will certainly require dedicated clinics to be set up around the world. One question is who will run these clinics and how will they be held accountable? I spoke to Bill Linton, who's the CEO of USONA Institute, a not-for-profit with a unique psilocybin synthesis method, who are now running clinical trials with the hope of supporting these future clinics. Our mission, and it's really the same that we had when we began in 2014, so six years ago, it's really to uh, conduct and to support both preclinical and clinical trials with psychedelic medicines. Well, how do you imagine that clinics will be regulated to avoid players coming into the market and um, cutting corners and reducing patient care in the name of shareholder profit? Like, would it be the FDA regulating it? Would it be another body or how, how might it work? I think the most important aspect here, because FDA will not be directly regulating clinics and users, is that USONA, as the drug supplier, uh, has the control over where it goes. This is a very critical point. It's not that just because we're the supplier, anybody can write a prescription for it and receive it through CVS or Walgreens. Uh, this is like, or Boots or whatever it is. Uh, so um, our plan is to make it available, but only to certified or certificated centers that we know have done the appropriate training. Interesting. And, and do you imagine that other um, <clears throat> suppliers of, say, psilocybin or, or another psychedelic who are supplying the clinics, do you think they would take a, a, a similar model? And if so, who, who would regulate um, everyone in the community? You know, because I saw, you know, in, in game theory, that would be the question. Who, who keeps everyone accountable? Remember, there's, there will be a very limited number of suppliers. And so I, I think um, uh, it's, it's going to be imperative on anybody who, is, who does have approval to ensure that, uh, that it is used in a safe way. Because when uh, something goes off the rails, when something occurs that uh, is not desirable, that is certainly going to affect whatever business model that they've set up and that can have a negative repercussion. And so I think even the, uh, the organizations that are purely for profit uh, see it in their interest to make sure that the outcomes are the best possible. Again, a for profit organization, uh, and there are, we see a lot that are springing up right now, you know, trying to, uh, in a way, go for the gold. This has now become very popular and uh, it's, it's, it's attracted people who have made money in the cannabis industry. It's attracting venture capital, hedge funds, uh, and so forth. Because again, it's, it's kind of the new thing and it's, and it's uh, got a lot of attractiveness to it uh, for its potential. It's kind of you know, an early stage emerging technology. And based on that, um, uh, it, it, there will be a lot of people with different ideas, different motivations coming in. Uh, I don't see any problem with these different approaches or even with uh, competitive approaches. I think where we kind of draw the line is where we see an attempt by 
any individual or any organization attempting to patent uh, inventions uh, of things that have already been in the public domain for, in many cases, decades. Uh, and often patent offices are not completely familiar with what all the history is. They should be, but they're not necessarily. Um, but we very actively defend uh, the field in the sense that um, we think it's important to make sure that there are not patents that prohibit people from practicing in this field. And we have a substantial effort and a commitment of funds to keep the field open. Uh, and it's kind of encompassed in this idea of open science. The idea that um, that things that are discovered, uh, methods that are developed, uh, really should be a part of the public domain and not um, owned simply for the purpose of maximizing profit. But again, people will have different views of this. There's a growing concern that companies will use conventional pharmaceutical industry tactics to corner the market. One organization that's been at the center of these concerns is Compass Pathways. The company went public in 2020 at a valuation of half a billion dollars. However, they faced criticism for allegedly blocking their rivals' access to psilocybin and asking academics to sign restrictive contracts that would not only give them control over the published results, but also any patents that come out of it. Compass Pathways has disputed these claims. I invited them to appear in this film, but received no reply. So you're like, okay, so now there's gonna be a rush to the bottom. So we got a gold rush <laughs> and we got a bunch of people piling in. Now we're gonna have massive public availability and a lot more people, both clinicians and patients coming into this experience at the same time that all the margins are getting massively undercut and there's gonna be a race to the bottom. So quality of care, the sophistication and complexity of what can be done because how many dollars do we have to devote to this you know, against existing medical models of just pop a pill go home, you know, we're not even going to do talk therapy anymore because that doesn't work out. That doesn't pencil out on the health insurance, <laughs> you know, uh, codes. Um, we're likely to see an erosion of care and an erosion of support and it will become more and more transactional at the very moment that it actually should become more and more integrative and holistic. USONA and companies like them have been involved in psychedelic research for many years. However, new players are flooding the market, raising concerns about how quality and ethics can be maintained. To respond to this, people within the psychedelic community have come together to create the North Star Ethics Pledge in an attempt to keep individuals and companies accountable. I spoke with one of its founders, Kat Kanoor, to understand the intention behind it. It's the North Star Pledge, which we've called an ethics pledge, but you could also call it an intention pledge um, because really let's call a spade a spade ethics are an incredibly contentious and complex concept that has been debated from time immemorial <laughs> but at the same time what it really is is saying hey we are we are reaching a new era phase in psychedelics where it is scaling quickly into the mainstream and so really holding this question of, for those who have been in relationship to this work, whether it's underground research, um, clinical trials, um, indigenous backgrounds, that there's, um, there are values and hopes, aspirations, and context that this legacy community, we'll call it, um, are holding. And our aim with the pledge was to really hear from different stakeholders in the field, hear their hopes, hear their concerns. How can we help welcome newcomers into the field um, and help guide them and guide ourselves as we all stretch and grow um, with this enormous task of making these medicines available at scale to those who need them? What, what might be different about me investing in psychedelic medicine compared to, say, um, electric cars? You know, what, what are some of the things that I might need to consider uh, that it would be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, there's what do you need to consider and what might be wonderful for you to consider. <laughs> 
two questions and the what would be wonderful to consider um although i could say it's neat as well is not just specific to psychedelics it's looking at the systems of oppression that reproduce inequity and have created a society where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer um, to really ask, like, those are some of the harms. That's the like meta context that leads most of us, whatever end of that equation that we're on in need of healing. Um, and that these medicines can support us in. But if we're investing in companies that are reifying the system, then while we're trying to do palliative care and put band-aids on this, we're reproducing the same harms that make these medicines really necessary in the first place. And so the choices that we make now in terms of how we structure our businesses, how we treat ourselves and each other in the companies we're building, um, all of that trickles down to the patient and the, pa the provider and the experience that they're having. And so that that treatment they're receiving is embedded within that system. And so is it an extractive model? If so, then that's impacting the, the quality of treatment and the outcomes that are there. So we're really asking, and, and I'm happy to say that we're seeing more and more entrepreneurs coming into the space who are questioning the model. I raised some of these issues with Ronan Levy, who's the CEO of Field Trip, a psychedelic therapy startup that floated on the stock market in October 2020. Yeah, I mean, with the influx of capital and, and a for-profit motive, you know, I, I respect that there are concerns from a number of people that it's going to be a race to the bottom. But in my mind, that's two things. First of all, uh, for-profit enterprise doesn't necessarily need, lead to a race to the bottom. It can actually be very productive and enhancing. Um, secondly, you know, the risks of bad actors exists across the spectrum. It exists in nonprofit. It, it, it exists in, in academic institutions. It's not unique to for-profit businesses. You know, to those people who are concerned about the entrance or any bad bad actor in, in this space, I think the important thing is just to be responsible, right? When you think about what the word responsibility is broken down into, it's the ability to respond, which is let's go in with an open mind. Let's respect the intentions of the people who are getting involved across the platform. And let's respond to circumstances. We may see that 99% of the people, in fact, I expect 99% or more of the people getting involved or doing it the right way with a view to really creating significant impact. And for those in the for-profit side, profit as well, but they don't have to be, uh, you know, misaligned. And I can actually, actually be very well aligned. But if, it, if we find that it's turning in a way that's creating risks or bad outcomes uh, too much, you know, there's, there's always benefits and losses in any direction that you go, then let's respond. Let's have a conversation. Let's let's work with those circumstances. But I think to, to resist um, or oppose the entry of investment capital for profit enterprises is, is short-sighted. What new capital and, and for-profit enterprises entering into the psychedelic industry does is enable a lot of things. To us, philosophically, we think business when done properly, when done ethically, is a is a great amplifier. You know, it, it encourages innovation, it encourages excitement, it encourages new participants to come in. And and so that's what's incredibly exciting about this. You know, the 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 promise of psychedelic therapies is incredible, and that's why we're so excited about it. But there are challenges that need to be overcome it's not cheap. It, it requires a lot of professional consideration. It requires a lot of time. It requires new space. Um, and in order to make this as accessible as possible to really create the impact that we talk about, you know, our mission is to bring the world to life. That means everybody uh, to benefit from psychedelic therapies, whether it's in treating mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, PTSD, or if it's just enhancing your life through increased creativity, increased empathy, more openness. These are things that the world can benefit from. And in order to do that, 
we need to innovate. We need more people involved in the industry. We need more people excited and incentivized in, in the right ways uh, to help this industry grow. And that's what we think the importance and advantage of having a for-profit aspect of the industry um, does. But in the same token, you know, we, we fully believe in order for psychedelics to achieve their potential uh, for humanity and the planet, and it's going to take work from for-profit entities, not-for-profit entities, academic institutions. It's, it's going to require a lift from everybody as we continue to see this industry evolve. Let's imagine 10 years from now that there are psychedelic clinics on every corner. Will we have billboards advertising LSD or psilocybin treatment? And will these substances be stripped of their spiritual roots, like yoga and mindfulness, to make them more palatable to the mainstream? And does it matter if people are getting access to a potentially healing experience? Philosopher and psychedelic commentator Eric Davis thinks it does, so I spoke to him to find out why. One of the most interesting things about psychedelics is that the stories we tell about them, the narratives we have going into an experience, directly shape that experience, the so-called principle set and setting. And, you know, there's an argument to be made that a lot of things are kind of like this, but with psychedelics, it's very strong. You know, some people argue that it's almost everything. I don't believe that, but I do think it's, it's really important to be aware of the stories that we are telling. Um, and, and because they do make a real difference. And one of the fascinating things now, troubling in, in many ways, but also just plum fascinating, is that there are so many narratives, competing narratives in many, uh, in many cases, and a lot of dynamics in these narratives. As new actors come into the field, the mainstreaming of psychedelics isn't just a matter of new corporations and different portrayals by media and uh, new mechanisms of research, et cetera, et cetera. It's also these new stories. So what is the story, you know, what's the story we're getting, particularly with medicalization in the already very, you know, noticeable kind of context of wellness and personal healing. You know, there's a, a, a mental health crisis in the West, probably around the world at this point. Uh, there haven't been good drugs uh, since the 1980s, and even those weren't very good. And so there's, there's very much a desperation within the medical industry, within the psychiatric industry, to come up with something better. And what's happening now with psychedelics is almost like mindfulness plus drugs, if, if we've been paying attention to the wellness space for the last decade, we've seen something very similar happen with mindfulness, where a kind of aspect of a larger, more spiritual current is sort of separated and isolated, brought into the fold of business people, of ordinary people just trying to get through their day, of cognitive behavior therapy, of the whole sort of industry of wellness that is responding to this mental health crisis and put forward for a while as a panacea. Like this stuff is the dynamite. It's nothing but good. Everyone should be doing this. We should, we're going to transform people. And, you know, even though I'm a, I'm pro meditation, I'm very interested in meditation. I've spent a lot of my type, time meditating, uh, you know, from the get go, you're like, ah, I don't know how this is really, how this is going to pan out. And now, Years after this process has happened, what do we see? Well, we see more cautionary accounts, both from within psychiatry and, and the wellness industry. So mindfulness is just a great model of a certain process of, of what happens when a panacea enters the market. When we look at the narratives uh, that are emerging around psychedelic medicine, uh, what do we find? we find that there tends to be a, a turn towards the individual, which reflects the larger kind of condition we're in of late capitalism, where consumerism and a lot of things are designed to sort of remind us that we are individuals that make consumer decisions and we have some kind of agency, we, we, we still vote, you know, we're, we're those kinds of, but it's much, there's much more importance placed on individual experience than on collective or ecological or symbiotic relationships 
particularly relationships with non-humans, whether it's the planet or the plants in my neighborhood or the animals in my backyard or whatever. That's not something that's particularly of value, even though those, those experiences are very much associated with the history of psychedelic use, both in traditional situations and in a more countercultural situation. Uh, so there's, we're in this paradoxical place of, of actually kind of cutting off a lot of the more, uh, in a way, more, the, the, the more radical healing potential of these things. Um, I, I just don't believe that, that psychedelics are a panacea the way that people want them to be. be. And when I read the, the result, the po extremely positive results of certain studies, I, I go, wow, they got some good placebo mojo going. It doesn't mean that psychedelics aren't healing or aren't heal more healing in certain circumstances than others. But right now, there's just this massive narrative of transformation that people desperately want, both profiteers, clinicians, uh, uh, new, new kinds of service providers, and individuals who are seeking healing. Everybody wants it to be true. So for a little while, it's probably going to be true. But are there other stories we could tell about psychedelics as they go mainstream? And are there other approaches we could take? Economist Bennett Zellner has spent a lot of time thinking about this and developed something called the pollinator approach that could provide an ethical model for psychedelic clinics. I think in order to really understand the pollination approach, it's important to understand the current context. And so the current context that we live in is what I refer to, I refer to our current system as a system of extractive capitalism. So you have giant corporations have displaced um, local, locally owned and operated businesses all over the US. And the result is that you have these one-way flows of, ca of financial capital, one-way flows of, of income, uh, of the economic value being produced from these communities to these distant shareholders. There are epidemic rates of depression and anxiety. There's also a suicide epidemic. The, the, this, the national suicide rate in the U.S. is the highest. It's been like 40 or 50 years and it's continuing to increase. And I, I think that what this, these, these um, high rates of mental distress reflect is the alienation that people feel and the economic anxiety they feel as a result of this extractive, of this system of extractive capitalism. So if you want to start thinking, if you want to think about truly healing people rather than just trying to manage their symptoms, which is what the current system does, you need to start to get at the roots of the problem. So psychedelic, so psychedelic therapy is uniquely suited to, to assist in this area. Uh, one of the primary channels through which psychedelic therapy helps people heal is by creating openness to connection, connection with themselves, uh, connection with others, and connection you know, with the earth. So the core idea behind the pollination approach is to leverage this, peer, this, this, this window of openness that people feel after they receive psychedelic therapy to reconnect them to community systems. To, to, so people who are depressed, people who are, who are suffering from anxiety, people who are suffering from addiction are the most disconnected people of all. So part of the idea is to form explicit, is to form close partnerships with different types of organizations in the community. These could be business organizations, cultural uh, organizations, nonprofits, uh, you, the, the whole gamut. And to help guide these people after they have their psychedelic experience to reconnect with these different community systems. And, and in doing that, you're not only helping the individuals themselves, but you're also helping to revitalize the community. Albert Hoffman, the scientist who discovered LSD, famously called it his problem child. He was referring in part to what happened when it hit the mainstream in a culture that wasn't quite ready for it. And that's my biggest concern, that we aren't ready. Psychedelic mainstreaming is happening so fast that we're at risk of losing connection to the deeper narratives. We need to use them responsibly. Indigenous narratives, countercultural, and clinical. But as many people I spoke to pointed out, it's too late to go back. And so the question for me is, how do we steward these medicines in such a way so that we don't strip them of what they have to teach us in the first place? 
or of their ability to transform us as individuals and as a culture. It's going to be a hard balancing act, and psychedelics also have a way of subverting our best laid plans. By their nature, they give us the experience we need, not the experience we want. And perhaps that's exactly what we're going through right now. Thanks for watching.